6 o'clock, Joe. All right. The Mayor Kim Zee to call the meeting to order. You're muted. There we go. 6 p.m. We'll call the regular village board meeting to order Tuesday, June 9th. Uh, still conducted electronically pursuant to uh, Illinois under a disaster declaration from the governor. Uh, and continues to limit the number of people that can be in the room at the same time. There we are still in a virtual meeting. If you want to join me and join me in a moment of silence. Also, if you would join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Allegiance to the flag, the United States of America, the original colors, the one that has the greatest liberty to justice for all people. Thank you. Mr. Clerk, would you take the roll, please? Sure. Trustee Mann. Present. Trustee Gerger. Present. Trustee Charles. Present. Trustee Detmers. Here. Trustee Mao. Present. And Trustee Churchill. Chair. And Mayor Kinsey. Also present. Uh, Pat, were there any public announcements in it? There, there was not a public announcement. There was a public comment. Uh, were there any public announcements? There were no public announcements, but there was one public comment. Read that into the record. Hello, I live at 313 Cary Lane, Chatham, Illinois, 62629. My name is Nathan Millspaugh. I would like to discuss the water flooding issue that happens a few times each year in my backyard and my neighbor's backyard. It appears that the drainage capacity of our neighborhood is inadequate to handle a large rainfall. The water completely fills up the underground drains and overflows causing floods in the streets and in my yard. Each big rainfall in the spring brings in all the old corn husk from the farm fields and flows into my backyard. The drains, the streets, and the streets helping to add to the problem. Something needs to be done. I had water damage in my basement from the last time we had a heavy rainfall about three weeks ago. My neighbor and I have reported the issue several times over the last couple years. The village of Chatham has been called out many times to assess the situation and clean up the aftermath. Those workers have witnessed the flooding firsthand. I have a ton of pictures and video to share. I know the village is about to dig a trench in my backyard to run underground electric line. I was wondering if something could be done at the same time to help divert the water and help stop flooding issues that should have been handled a long time ago. I would like to discuss this issue tonight at the meeting. Thank you. What was that address again, Pat? Say that again. What was that address again? 313 Cary Lane. That's a, that's a street that backs up to the farm field that is just off of Walnut Street. It backs up, it's on the east side of the farm field between the water tower and uh, the subdivision that Matt lives in there. Um, and I will say that uh, there was a, a massive crash that morning. But when you get that much rain in that short amount of time, there's no drainage system going to be able to go or handle all that water like that. I mean, it's just it's the end of the amount of water we have to do all the time. We, I did have Shane, after getting these comments, I did have Shane go out and take a look, and he responded back to uh, uh, Nathan. 
He said, unfortunately, we only have a utility easement along that cornfield. Please see the attached PDF. The drainage surface stormwater easement was designed to collect at 313 Cary Lane and had been designed to flow between 313 and 307. At looking at the aerial photography of the area, it looks like 307 has added a structure along the drainage easement. If 307 had changed the grade, then there would be flooding in that area. It appears that a garage was built over the flood, the floodway there. Have no idea when it was built, how long it's been there, but that's the situation. All right, thank you. So we'll move to the consent agenda, unless anybody had any questions there. They can come in and sit as long as they're six feet apart from each other. Could I have a uh, trustee Mason could have a motion to put the consent agenda on the table. Trustee Mayor. If you would sit six feet apart from each other, please. Ryan, you have to remember to unmute yourself. Now. Now, now let's try it. I'll make that motion. All right, and Trustee Charles, could I have a second there, please? That, I'll second. All right, is there any question regarding the minutes from May 26th of the Warrant Resolution 2420? Mr. Clark, would you take a roll, please? Trustee Mann. Yes. Trustee Gerger. Yes. Trustee Charo. Yes. Trustee Detmers. Yes. Trustee Mao. Yes. Trustee Sherno. Yes. Okay, no under new business. Uh, Trustee Detmers, I have a motion to bring up uh, both resolutions for maintenance under that Illinois Highway Code section. Uh, item one and item two to the table at the same time. We'll let Jim address both of these together. Yes, I wish to make that motion. Trustee Scherz, what can you second that? I'll second. All right. Jim, uh, these two items are the motor fuel tax money, and Jim, you're there to explain these two. Uh, yes, I am. Uh, there are two maintenance resolutions that we have in front of the board to vote on and approve. Uh, the first one, uh, entitled Section 20 uh, gm uh, consists of maintenance activities to be completed by the Village of Chatham Roadway staff. Uh, and we have one uh, small bidding item uh, associated with that with concrete patching. But uh, the items included in the first maintenance resolution includes work for sidewalk and curb work uh, by two minutes patching. Uh, road salt winter maintenance activities, uh, roadside maintenance, uh, shoulders aggregate, uh, miscellaneous traffic control devices such as signs, sign posts, um, barricades. Uh, let's see, we have paper, uh, we have crack sealing, uh, grading and shaping ditch work, um, PCC patching, which will be material only, um, as we had set up with the village staff. And then we have a, a small PCC patching item uh, that we've completed in the past couple of years that would be um, limited to a $20,000 item. The second maintenance resolution that we have would be a bid item for miscellaneous roadway repairs. And this would be a um, you know, larger type project. Uh, we have slated uh, for that $110,000 in the MFT money. And that would be something similar to what we've done in the past, uh, whether that be like uh, Marble Stone or along Oak Brook. And um, you know, we'd work with uh, village staff to identify those locations and apply those funds uh, to a significant uh, roadway repair uh, location with that. So those are the two maintenance resolutions uh, that we have in front of the board uh, for your review and approval. The other item that we have is a um, deliver and install proposal. And what that is is for concrete and um, materials uh, to be supplied for the patching activities associated with the first maintenance item. 
uh, because the volume of concrete that we're purchasing uh, exceeds the state limit of $25,000 for bidding. Uh, we anticipate doing a, a, a significant amount of concrete patching this year. And um, what we will do is bid that item and for materials only, and then the village staff would have that available for will call uh, for patching activities throughout the construction year. So that's a summary of the three items before you. Does anyone have any questions for Jim for discussion regarding these maintenance resolutions? Okay, and then just again, uh, Trustee Detmers, could I have a motion to accept both of these items in a single vote? I make that motion. And Trustee Schurz, would you second that? I second. Uh, Mr. Clerk, would you take the roll, please? Trustee Mann. Yes. Trustee Gerger. Yes. Trustee Farrell. Yes. Trustee Detmers. Yes. Trustee Mann. Yes. Trustee Sherhill. Yes. All right. Thank you. Item three. Trustee Gerger, could you make a motion for me to amend the 428-2020 meeting minutes to reflect the fact that the term of Chris Parks on the police pension board uh, is through 5 to 2022. This is a request for the police pension board uh, to meet once their qualifications that they need uh, just the record and add minutes that way. After you after you remove yourself. So, so, uh, okay. Uh, Trustee Mann, would you second that? I will second that. All right. The, the description there was pretty self-evident. Does anybody have any questions? Mr. Clark, would you take a roll, please? Trustee Mann. Yes. Trustee Gerger. Yes. Trustee Chara. Yes. Trustee Detmers. Trustee yes. Detmers. Yes. Yep. Trustee Mile. Yes. Trustee Scherzo. Yes. Thank you. Four is Dave. Can I make a question? Of if everyone could view when you're not talking, there's a lot of feedback. Thank you. I'm four now. Budget discussion. Sherry is with us tonight to go through the budget. Uh, a slightly different approach to what we're doing this year. Um, usually by this point in time, well, usually by this point in time, we would have passed the budget because we're into the current fiscal year. Given a lot of uncertainty that presented itself with the COVID-19 and the shutdowns and wanting to understand what the state approach was going to be with their allocation and distributive funds, we held back. Uh, the staff was getting close to having a budget presentation in March before the stay-at-home orders were issued and businesses started shutting down. Uh, so rather than rush something that would be incorrect, this thing started to calm down and we had a clear picture on it. Uh, they've held back. And then over the past weeks, they've gone back to looking through where they were um, at that point with their thought process in March versus what we want to pose as a final budget or the, it'll be the, the initial operating budget for fiscal year 2021. Um, so what Sherry had provided to you guys was kind of a thought flow memo that said, here's what we were thinking at that point, here's how far we had gone in our budget process, uh, and here's how events have transpired and certain revenues have changed in their anticipation. Uh, continue to see that revenue projections will change uh, as indeed IML issued a update to their revenue projections this morning, uh, which thankfully were, were better than what we had been working on. Uh, so she was there to kind of walk through this memo. What we're looking for from the board tonight is to kind of 
give the nod that the approach to budgeting that we're proposing for this year is going to be acceptable. Before we have her and Kayla and the staff do the work that puts together that large budget document, given the timing on where we're at and everything else that we want, I want to make sure that we're cognizant of the time and effort it gives to share and the staff to put all that together so that we can proceed on to our budget process. So with that, Sherry, we'll let you walk everybody through what you have as far as where the revenue projections are and how that lines up into projected expenses for the year. All right. As Dave said, on March 12th was our last meeting as a management team to go over the budget in person. And at that time, we had worked through a budget surplus in the general fund of $4,299. Is she there, Pat? Can you hear? Huh? No. Okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Now we're ready. All right. I'll start with back in March. On March 12th, 2020, was our last in-person budget meeting with the management team to go over the budget. At that time, we had worked through a general fund budget surplus of $4,299, and we were still working on things at that point. We hadn't moved into really getting through the electric and water and sewer funds at that point. Since then, we've had some remote meetings and discussing the effects of COVID-19 and the decrease in state shared revenues, the decrease in our sales tax. I had to look at putting a hold on filling any vacant positions in this budget, only having two needed equipment purchases being included, but having those contingent on meeting certain revenue and expense goals and not planning on acting on those until later in the fiscal year. This morning, we did have good news and update, like Dave said, from the Illinois Municipal League that increased the state shared revenue projections. So before this morning, we were looking at $128,000 deficit in the general fund. It's been reduced to $38,000, so that's really good news for us. I'm really happy to hear that. There are a lot of things that we discussed during the 2021 budget that are not in the budget, and some of those things that we eliminated and not even approached putting in was increasing the 4th of July program. There were discussions of working with the school and hiring a school resource police officer. Part of that cost was the school was going to partially fund that with a grant that they'd applied through us. Let's see, the street department wanted a truck and a plow. We were looking at possibly hiring more temporary part-time employees in the parks, purchase of a vehicle for the parks, bike trail maintenance program, West Park Pavilion roof, and then the dog park was also in there. But the one item in the general fund that is proposed for the end of the fiscal year is a purchase of a truck from Chatham Township in the amount of $22,000. That's provided that our general fund revenues are coming in as planned. And also, since that purchase is also contingent on our telecommunications taxes coming in as projected, because part of the purchase will be purchased out of the utility tax fund. So even though we're looking at a projected operating deficit, we've really done a great job in keeping our cash reserves up there. At this point in time, at the end of April, or at the end of our last fiscal year, April 30th, 2020, we actually had just over $2 million in cash in reserves, which represents over four months of cash built up to fund operating expenditures. Now, like in all of our budgets, we plan to, we have some certain items that are designated that are carrying forward from past years, like our accrued time 
payouts that will be owed to our employees if they should leave employment or if they should cash out their comp compensatory time or their vacation time. And uh, that amounts to about $358,000. Um, there's some money built up in the police restricted counts that amounts to about $32,300. Um, there's $30,000 carried forward for park development um, from fiscal year 2020. And then there's a, about a $39,000 transfer that needs to go into the capital project fund. This was from some uh, settlement proceeds related to the North Point subdivision. So we had those items in there as well. So if we were going to spend down all of those items, which is unlikely, plus also have our projected $38,000 deficit, that would bring our general fund cash uh, balance down to between a million five and a million six. And that still represents over three months of cash reserves and is still within our um, cash balance policy. So I'll go ahead and move on to the Cemetery Perpetual Care Fund. Um, this uh, is a fund of the village that uh, accumulates lot sales. Um, the uh, idea of this fund is set up as, as a trust, so all those lot sales have to stay in, um, in a trust and uh, cannot be used except um, as they build up, the interest earned off of those uh, funds that has built up over time can be used for the care and maintenance of the cemetery. So right now, the amounts that have built up in the fund that can be used for care and maintenance are just over $78,000. And in this budget, we had proposed to use those funds to uh, update uh, a road in the cemetery. And also going forward, um, is a proposal to uh, begin allocating 80% of the lot sales and able to do um, more improvements to the cemetery, including a, maybe a proposed future construction of a mausoleum to um, house cremations. Now, um, I'll move on. The next um, major um, item that we discussed during our meetings was the, you know, the electric fund. Uh, before COVID-19, we had about $180,000 uh, deficit. So we really hadn't gotten to work on uh, taking that deficit down. And um, after uh, COVID-19, we had to look at not assessing penalties and also uh, probably an increase in bad debt expense. So those were the major uh, adjustments to their that, uh, uh, funds budget. And um, right now, the way the budget is presented is it's um, assuming that we would be able to, again, begin, begin assessing penalties on late payments beginning in August and also begin uh, shutoffs at that point in time as well. Um, some other items that they they removed their vacant position. I didn't touch on this in the general fund, but um, there is a vacant position in the police department that um, helped out in getting their bu uh, budget deficit cut down as well. <laughs> but um, there is a vacant position in the electric department that is not funded this year. And... Um, after making those adjustments, we still had a, uh, a budget deficit of $78,283. Uh, looking, other items to consider regarding this deficit, um, we do have a large um, uh, construction project, the Mansion Road project to, I'm, God, I can't remember exactly. Can you describe the Mansion Road project? Yeah, it's, it's run from the, uh, substation at Independence over to uh, where it uh, up Route 4 along Mansion Road and then it ties in at uh, uh, Savannah. So, um, the total project for that cost for that is about $349,000 and that, that's included in that, that deficit. Um, in addition to the uh, accumulated uh, uncompensated absences uh, 
that if we were to fund with cash on hand would result in $218,500. Um, something I wanted to also point out, if we are not able to begin uh, assessing penalties and resuming collection procedures by August 1st, uh, it, that amounts to about $29,750 a quarter in um, penalty income. And I'm just looking at how our bed debt expense could rise if we're not able to do shutoffs and that. And I'm looking at probably about $21,000 per quarter. Now I'll go ahead and, uh, the electric fund, like the general fund, is got a very healthy cash reserve at 3244705 and that represents three and a half months of proposed 2021 electric fund expenditures. Now if we were to fund all the um, items is being paid um, with cash on hand that, that we've identified such as the um, accrued time payouts that would uh, re reduce their um, cash balances down to just over three months of expenditures, still at the upper end of our cash balance policy between two and three months. And now in the water and sewer fund, um, we had a deficit at March 12th of 24,785, which was in pretty good shape. Um, they also are affected by um, possible increase of bad debt expense, uh, reduction of penalty income. Uh, their department took their budget and uh, proposed various cuts to, to free up some money for a much needed uh, one ton truck for their, uh, their staff to use for water taps, I believe. And we'll also be able to use it in the winter time to plow snow with it. Um, again, this purchase would not be uh, completed till after much later in the fiscal year and provided that um, revenues and expenditures are staying in within targets. So uh, after their various cuts and our adjustments for the effects of the penalty uh, income, they actually have a budget surplus of 80690 so that, that's really really good news. Um, their cash balances are, are right around the, the two-month time frame. And um, if we were to pay out the, um, the a couple items that are identified to be paid out with cash on hand, such as they are accrued over time, and also they have the inner fund loan to the electric fund in the amount of $89,000, they would fall just below the two-month uh, time frame. Uh, but um, I would just, you know, recommend that the village make conscious effort over the next couple of years to uh, get that um, brought back up into our um, or a preferred uh, cash balance level. So that is pretty much um, where we're at with the budget right now. Can we answer any questions? Yeah, uh, thank you, Sherry. Um, that's that's a lot more detail than we normally would go into at, at this point in time. And kind of a different thought process, but this is a different year for multitude of reasons. So what I want to you know, emphasize is the budget that's going to be proposed doesn't propose decreasing our service levels that have been expected over the years throughout the village. What it does do is provide for more of a strategic cash flow management approach so that we're not over committing ourselves to any extensive uh, capital investments or expansion projects until we've seen that all the expected revenues are indeed coming in at the spot where we think they're going to be expected. Uh, but we'll put into that that's still in discussion uh, and not finalized uh, as the state hasn't, hasn't submitted the full budget to the governor nor has it been signed off by the governor. Uh, but still in discussion, our capital project grants from the state, uh, there's allocation of Federal CARES Act funds that will come via the state once they finalize what that distribution
distribution formula is going to look like in light of the grants that we're anticipating the Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity, they may be restricted to certain purposes or specific purposes. Also still in discussion on the federal level is the possibility of what if any federal direct to municipality aid may come in the next round of coronavirus relief provisions that are undertaken at the federal level. The federal house passed one version of it. The Senate is debating different versions of that. I don't think that's going to be a quick answer, but at some point I think we'll probably settle on something in there. So this year more than any other year, I do anticipate at some point as those pieces are settled and finalized what they look like, that there will be a need for supplemental appropriations or the opportunity to do supplemental appropriations that start to tackle some of those expansion projects that we would have liked to undertake this year. What Sherry was describing to you in that memo is typically the thought process that the staff undertakes every single year. They start looking at their budget based on here's a whole bunch of things that we would like to get done now. They start to whittle down as what's the most critical and what is the most applicable use and efficient use of the resources that we're going to have available to us. That type of management over the seven years that I've been involved with the board has put us in a position that I think would be envied by a lot of communities where we're actually talking about a budget that is going to be able to sustain our service levels while many other communities are going to start talking about what they have to cut, who they have to cut, and or what taxes they have to raise. So all that said, is there any questions for Sherry or Pat or myself at this point in time? Just because we're electronic, let me do it this way. I'll just run down the line so that we're not trying to talk over everybody. So we'll start with Trustee Pan. My only question is more along the lines of the, can you describe kind of your process on how you took what you had in your almost completed budget and then how did you work through that and reduce to what you've come up with here? Sure. I think the thing to kind of keep in mind, again, because this is thought flow, having 12, which is the last time the staff was able to sit down in a room together and start hashing out in a normal budget scenario, they were essentially done with the proposal for the general fund and getting ready to start on the electric one. So this was just preliminary on where they were at the electric before they start to ask difficult questions or start to ask kind of the input that goes in where, you know, you have multiple departments to start talking through stuff like, you know, what inventory do you already have on hand? You know, what vehicles are you looking to replace? And then you start getting input back and forth from others that will say, you know, if we structure our workflow in this process, we can work through the stock of meters that we have on hand and we don't need to accelerate purchasing more this year. So those kinds of discussions are what goes on. Does that make sense to you, Brian? Yeah. So, I mean, so when making these decisions, was it, you know, how did you prioritize what got cut and what stayed? So I think the right language to use is not necessarily what got cut. It is what was... What didn't get proposed. How about that? What didn't get proposed. On the target list. So if you were to look back in the large budget documents that we've had and, you know, ultimately produced, there are some things in there that start talking about five-year capital plans. There's things that talk about, you know, what is our ongoing approach to keeping vehicle maintenance up and doing replacement on vehicle maintenance. So those things are in there. And each year we pursue certain grants, certain funding, there's certain partnerships that might be able to tackle any number of those priorities. We do think some of those capital projects are going to happen. But based on the fact, on just the calendar, how it's going this year, where the state rushed the budget, 
in the details on how those grants are going to be allocated and how that funding is going to be allocated isn't out yet. We're just being pushed to do any of those. We think it's more practical to wait and see what the criteria around issued grants is to make sure that we're moving towards the right project that fits with the funding and not overcommit ourselves at this point in time. Ryan, if you're looking for some specific items, if you look on page two where it says items discussed that are not included in the current budget, those are all items that we initially had put in that we wanted to be able to do this year, but we removed them because of the cost and we knew that we were going to have less funds to be able to spend. Okay, yeah, that's... That makes sense? More on the line. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Okay, you're good, Trustee Man? Yep. Okay, Trustee Gurman. So, the discussion tonight is really just if, if we're okay with the process, how we're doing it, correct? It's not specific budget items, and we'll still get a chance to look at, review the budget book and pass that. It, yeah, so the, the process to pass the, the appropriations that have to be passed by the village every year, uh, we technically have until the end of July to get that done under the schedule that we're at. Our fiscal year started in uh, May 1. Yep. So we're already in it, uh, operating under, you know, a go forward similar to what we did last year. To get to the spot where we actually pass that appropriation, it requires the vote. We have a publication notice. We have to have a public hearing, uh, do all of those things. Uh, Given the uncertainty that was caused by the pandemic this year and not having any kind of clear indication on what the state was going to do, we should have um, been very cognizant of the time of Sherry and Kayla and our staff uh, because that final budget and that big book that has all the details and has all the explanation on it, it gets a lot easier to understand than, you know, just trying to follow through on the thought process. It takes a lot of time. So yep. we wanted to present this kind of thought process and, you know, and, and make sure that the board was aligned in the approach that we think we can take care of the service level that everybody expects out of the village this year. And only have to go into our rainy day funds to a small extent um, and, and actually not even deplete them less than, you know, what our targets were in almost every instance. But we want to make sure that we're comfortable with that approach before all that work was done. So this isn't a vote, this is just a... Yeah, yeah I'm okay with that approach to uh, kind of just lay out the, 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 the rework, but to actually look at the budget and analyze it uh, later is, is fine. Um, but yes, no, I understand projections that we're using and all that, and I'm, I'm okay with that approach. The, the thing to look at too, Brad, is we're at $38,000 deficit. We were... We were planning a higher deficit than that and having to spend some cash on hand. If some of these items that are in this list here that the board really wants to add those back, we will look at those and come up with a cost and see how much that puts us into our cash on hand. We can still get that stuff done this year, still be in our guideline, but just remember that we're spending some of the cash on hand. Now, this year, we thought if we were going to do all these items here, we were going to have to get into cash on hand anyway. We've been saving up for all these years to be able to tackle some of these projects. So look at it that way too. This is where we put it and we tried to present it the most efficient way we could. If you need to add some of this stuff back, we can do it. If there's stuff that you want to take out, we can do it. There isn't a lot though that we can take out because it's pretty much paying salaries, insurance, maintenance, items like that. The day-to-day -day operations to keep things going. Sounds good. All right. Thank you. Trustee Char. You have to unmute first. Oh, let me let me mute, unmute. Where's she at? Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead, Kristen. All right. Kristen? Unmute. Okay. Can you hear me? We can yeah, now. now. you're good. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I get closer to my computer. This is like a Saturday Night Live thing. 
Okay. I like the idea of uh, sustaining our uh, services and not cutting and um, not raising taxes. So, yeah, I'm good. And the possibility of capital projects as well sounds exciting if we can get that done. Okay. Thank you, uh, Trustee Devers. So we covered we covered the items. I think the approach is good. Thank you, and Trustee Manley. You know, as discussed earlier, um, I believe uh, we are going to put the
visual presentation of the budget that you're used to seeing in, in our meeting with slide decks that talks about specific projects that talks about you know more in line with what typically would have been presented as, as a budget so that would be on track for the next meeting uh, as you look through these things now you've heard you've heard this thought process and hopefully that gives you a better I mean, this year's I'm not, but generally this is the process that the staff goes through and go through every year as we develop a budget is put all these things out there and then go back and do what's practical and what's the most effective. So it's a little more insight than what we would typically have gone through on budget development, but I think this year more than any, it's important to understand how that thought process works. Uh, and it's difficult to have meetings as it is, so it's more that we can talk about it and put some of that out there is beneficial. So that would be the course of action there. Uh, are there any additional public comments on village business? Pat, it sounded like maybe you had some arrived. Well, Dave, since the meeting started, we have two residents that have uh, joined the meeting here. Do either of you two have any uh, comments for the uh, village business this evening? No comments. <laughs> no comments tonight? Okay. All right, schedule of meetings then is the Planning Commission at 6 p.m. on June 18th, the Village Board, again 6 p.m. June 23rd, Village Board 6 p.m. July 14th, the Committee of the Whole follows that at 6.15 thereafter, the Utility Oversight Committee is scheduled for 6 p.m. on August 10th, and the Senate Fire and Police Commission is September 16th at 5.30 p.m. Right, we have no need for a closed session this evening. Uh, so, Trustee Mountain, could I have a motion to adjourn the board meeting? Sorry, Dave. I, I, had I think we lost him. I got to unmute him. There we go. Matt? Trustee Mountain, could I have a motion to adjourn? I think he said I'll make that motion. Make that motion, yeah. There we go. Uh, Trustee Detmer, could I have a second? A second. All right, uh, Mr. Clerk, would you take a roll, please? Oh, I got to unmute Joe. There we go. All right, sorry, okay. Joe. Mr. Clerk, would you take a roll, please? Sure. Trustee Mann. Yes. Trustee Gerger. Yes. Trustee Charo. Yes. Trustee Detmers. Yes. Trustee Mann. Yes. Trustee Scherzo. Yes. All right. Board meeting stands adjourned. Uh, Trustee Gerger will turn it over to you for the committee. Thank you, sir. My committee. And we're well past the time, right? We can go ahead and go right into it. Yes. Uh, all order, uh, Mr. Clerk. Call? Sure. Trust, trustee Mann. Present. Trustee Charo. Present. Trustee Detmer. Here. Trustee Miles. Present. Trustee Sheridan. Here. Chairman Gerber. Here. Uh, do we have any uh, public comments on agenda topics? Okay. Would either of you two care to comment? No, no comments. Okay. Can I have a motion to bring the consent agenda forward? To, for the uh, minutes? I'll make the motion. I'll second. Who made the motion? Detmers. Trustee Detmers makes the motion, seconded by Trustee Scherchel. Um, can we get a roll call just because we're over video? Is there any discussion? Does anybody have discussion on minutes? All right, here we go. Can we get a roll? Mr. Clark? Trustee Mann? Yes. Trustee Charo? Yes. Trustee Detmers? Yes. Trustee Miles? Yes. Trustee Scherzel? Yes. And Chairman Gerger? Yes. Okay, old business, we have nothing. A new business, uh, Pat, is there CMT engineering updates? There is. Jim is still here. Okay, uh, good evening. Um, 
couple of items here uh, I talked earlier uh, in the previous meeting uh, regarding some of the activities that we've been uh, completing. Uh, one is development of the MFT program, uh, in which we voted on the resolution uh, earlier. So uh, we're going to be moving forward with that, submitting those documents tied out for approval and uh, moving on with uh, with internal maintenance and then uh, roadway projects um, uh, garnering the, the most attention. Also working with uh, village staff in terms of looking at uh, funding options and uh, bonding money available to the village on capital improvement projects and which projects those are eligible for and trying to prioritize those as we move forward. Once we have that list identified, uh, we'll present to the board uh, which projects um, you know, we'd like to complete and move forward on. Another item that we've been uh, working on is um, IEPA MS4 documentation. Uh, this is an annual permit uh, held by the village um, through the IEPA for municipal storm sewer systems. And uh, you know, as part of that, uh, you know, we've done things in the past in terms of you know erosion control, uh, monitoring um, you know streams and waterways within the village and just overall trying to reduce um, you know, erosion and discharge um, to the natural waterways. Uh, this is increasingly a, a, a hot topic um, for the city of Springfield, in particular Lake Springfield, as they're trying to reduce their sediment loads in the lake and phosphorus loads in the lake, and Chatham is a you know, good portion of the community that uh, you know, discharges to waterways that go to the lake. So, EPA is very critical on that, and uh, we're closing out last year's uh, program, which will be posted to the village's website, and then initiating uh, this year's uh, renewal permit moving forward. Um, another item related to MFT uh, in the process of uh, closing out last year's program and then working through uh, audit documents by routine audit, audit documents by the um, uh, Illinois Department of Transportation and bringing those numbers um, you know, up to par. And then uh, last item that uh, we're continuing to work on is um, drainage solutions there by the uh, Village um, Electrical Maintenance Building along South Main, looking at uh, options to alleviate flooding um, you know, through the Parkview subdivision. Uh, that's continued to be uh, an issue um, in terms of flooding of residence streets, um, and then also loss of access to the um, uh, maintenance facility garages uh, through the drive. Uh, actually, the last major rainfall that we had, uh, roadway was closed. Village vehicles had to park uh, on the street just off of uh, South Main because they could not get through the water uh, to service or access the maintenance building. So looking at options um, associated with uh, those improvements and you know, tying those to um, maybe some of the other funding and grant money available through the state. So other than that, that's about all I have. Any questions? Yeah, Jim, has, has the Illinois EPA offered up any more guidance on the, the silt and, you know, the, the, the overburden that they're, you know, that they're pursuing? Um, have they offered any more guidance now that we've been in that program now for a couple of years? Uh, what is there any new developments in that at all? Um, pretty much everything is stagnant in terms of the development. Um, you know, there were some studies done by the city of Springfield um, and then adopted by the IEPA in terms of you know allowable, allowable sediment loads and phosphorus loads. Um, to Lake Springfield and, you know, the, the village of Chatham, you know, as I said, being a major watershed to the city of Springfield, you know, we're sympathetic to that. Um, so what we've done is, you know, increased our, you know, patrol monitoring uh, ordinances to help reduce that. Um, you know, in particular, with larger scale developments, um, you know, we're requiring a monitoring, um, you know, full MPDS permits uh, for disturbances greater than one acre, and those are permits that are uh, filed by the actual developer through the EPA, but uh, the Village of Chatham serves as kind of an intermediate or, you know, to police those activities to make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. 
you know, the other item that we've identified too is, um, you know, a lot of the erosion is coming, you know, post development. Uh, so you have a subdivision and, you know, individual builders or individual lots are, you know, resulting in a lot of, um, you know, erosion uh, directly into storm sewer systems, which get into streams and waterways. So what you'll see around town is, uh, you know, more erosion control fence, um, you know, straw barriers around uh, development sites and uh, trying to control that, keeping the streets clean and so forth. But, um, you know, in terms of direct mandates from the IEPA, uh, the MS4 program is kind of, um, you know, a self-policing uh, program in which, you know, a little bit on the honor system, you know, we provide the documentation uh, to the EPA. It's, uh, it's accepted and reviewed, but it's, um, it's not necessarily looked at uh, unless there is a specific audit. Uh, Village did go through an audit uh, two years ago in which we worked with staff from IEPA to identify critical areas that uh, required improvements, and we've included that in our five-year plan to adopt those improvements. Uh, you know, one of the big significant items on that was stream monitoring. So we've got eight locations uh, within the village of Chatham that waterways, natural waterways, leave the corporate boundaries. And four times a year, we go out there, um, you know, in conjunction with village staff and and take a look at those waterways. Um, you know, is there a buildup of uh, sediment? Uh, is the water cloudy and murky? Um, is there an oil sheen on the water? Um, something that we can maybe track upstream to see if there's a, you know, an underlying problem or issue. Uh, the Plumber Boulevard project was a great project to reduce sediment into the stream. Um, you know, the roadway was basically subgrade was being washed into the storm sewer system and uh, going downstream into Polecat Creek. Uh, we address that issue with pipelining and sealing up those storm sewer systems. So, um, you know, while there's not been a direct mandate other than a sediment load um, and a phosphorus load provided by the EPA through a document study done by the City of Springfield, um, you know, there's no mandate in terms of how to monitor that, how to measure that, uh, under what conditions those measurements are made. Um, the village is trying to do their best part to be a good neighbor and, you know, monitor and police ourselves in terms of, you know, water we're accepting from offsite and distributing through the village and then discharging downstream, downstream and then trying to control, um, you know, erosion, sediment, pollutants getting into the storm sewer systems and waterways, um, you know, directly from the village. Um, so seeing a, you know, a significant reduction in, you know, clogged ditches, you know, um, dirt on roadways. Um, you know, not saying that it doesn't happen, but uh, it seems like it's a lot less frequent and, uh, you know, uh, builders, developers are doing a much better job in terms of making that more the norm rather than, uh, you know, having to hound them all the time. So, but uh, every year we pull together a kind of a five-year plan, some of it's education. Um, you know, one thing, uh, Ryan Crawford, he went and got his uh, stormwater certification, inspector certification documentation. So just little steps going through to make sure that we're always moving in a, in a positive direction to ensure that we're in compliance and, and showing a good faith effort until there is a, a strict mandate from the EPA that, you know, assigns a, a specific value or a specific target that we're trying to hit. Okay. Thank you, Jim. Okay. Thank you. I, I had a citizen reach out to me with respect to the water drainage issue north of the village electric shed. Pat, uh, he had sent me a bunch of pictures uh, this evening. Did, did he send those pictures to you as well? That's the one down at the by the exercise building. Yeah, I have you. We've we've done extensive work down there. CMT has surveyed all that area. They've got points, looked at it. Uh, you know, we yeah. talked about a short-term solution and a long-term solution, but we, the thing that we found was there is no short-term solution. The solution is we need to put a pond in down there to be able to get all that drainage ah. drained in. Yeah. Um, we left a meeting. Can you share those pictures? Yeah, we have not seen the pictures. Pat, have you received any pictures uh, from the homeowner? From from the guy right down there next to the exercise building, Dewey? 
Yes, he sent me picture, aerial pictures from what looks to be a drone. I did not see those. Can you, can you share those on your screen, Dewey? Um, they're via text. If you don't mind waiting a minute, I can transfer them to my email. And, or I could just email them to the group of us. Obviously, don't respond to my email, but um, it just shows the, the dream and in particular, the sort of the damage that's been done to his property. Um, so he's asking for some assistance in that. And, you know, and just comparing the images that he sent me to what images I see on Google Earth, this, this damage does appear to have been done recently. So I just wanted to give this gentleman an update. And, I, you know, as far as, like, well, we're going to have to wait to build a link I don't have any expectation as to when that might occur. I know we were looking for grants to try to do that and uh, haven't heard really any updates in that. It's just it's just hard a hard position for this guy to be in. Um, and my understanding is that you know he has had concerns in the past and it's I just don't know what to tell him and I'm looking for some help here. I told him the same thing. I talked to him. I told him I said, look, there's nothing that we can do for you right now. We are not putting water over on you. It's just the natural flow of that water in that area. So I will uh, share these pictures with the trustees, I guess, and with the mayor and Pat and see what you guys think about it. Um, but you guys have no, no time frame right on any of the modifications that would need to be made. Yeah, we've, we're looking, you know, I was out there during the last storm event and, uh, you know, there's, you know, two issues related to the drainage out there. And, uh, you know, the biggest one is conveyance of water and, you know, the volume of water going through there. And, you know, initially, Pat and I had discussed about, you know, possibly taking some of that water, um, you know, on the far west side and bringing it east. Uh, the problem with that is, you know, we're not improving or there's, you know, it's difficult to improve the conveyance channel through there. So any water that you divert from the west, bring it east, now that's making the situation worse on uh, the homeowners through the middle of that subdivision. Um, so one of two things either has to happen. One is either we reduce the volume of water through a pond structure or we increase the conveyance um, capacity, you know, through that subdivision or around that subdivision to get back down to, um, you know, the stream that runs through uh, the middle of the park. Um, neither of those are easy to do just because of the location and development around there. Um, as I discussed with Pat, it's probably going to take a combination of stormwater detention combined with increased conveyance, um, you know, through a, an additional storm sewer or, or pipe or ditch system uh, that drains that area through. Um, you know, it'll take more flow than what's there now, and then hopefully combined with a pond situation, um, you know, to help reduce the peak of the flow that goes through there. So whatever system that we can get in there in terms of conveyance, whether that's uh, additional ditching or, you know, pipe work, um, you know, that will meet the needs and, and reduce the flooding uh, for all people through Parkview subdivision. Um, you know, it's not just the gentleman that uh, has expressed his concerns that has issue. There's, you know, several others. Um, you know, as I assisted a resident, um, you know, unclogging a storm sewer drain further down the, in the intersection um, in that subdivision. So there are people all the way along that are experiencing flooding. And the last thing that we want to do is try to solve one area by making two other areas worse. So Not sure. because all of the areas are kind of tied together, the water has to get through there one way or another. Um, you know, as Pat says, currently that's the way it's going through. You know, some people have kind of accepted that and, and you know, that kind of their lot in life in terms of that's the conditions that they're uh, dealing with. Um, you know, whereas if we move that water around, anything that we do, you know, can and would exasperate other areas. And now you're getting calls from other, pay, you know, residents. Um, you know, having drainage problems that have never had drainage problems before. But, um, 
you know, the thoughts kind of running around in our mind is picking up another storm sewer system. There's a 36 inch uh, plastic pipe that drains through the backyards on the north side of uh, the service garage drive that comes out to South Main and then runs along the west side of South Main to the north and then discharges out to the box culvert uh, underneath um, South, uh, South Main. You know, what we're looking at is possibly running another storm sewer uh, along the north or along the south side of the service drive, cut across South Main, run it along the west side or the east side of uh, South Main to the north and discharge on the downstream side of the box culvert underneath South Main. That would eliminate or help alleviate, um, you know, some of the flooding just from a conveyance standpoint. But then combined with a pond uh, facility as we work through with Massey Massey and coming up with, you know, something that would be a recreational pond, dual use pond, um, that would help knock the peak off of the flow that would, uh, can, you know, be able to provide flood protection for greater intensity events. Um, that's kind of what's playing through our mind right now in terms of, you know, what would be a viable solution in this area. But, uh, you know, once again, you know, digging a, you know, 10 acre pond and putting in, you know, thousand foot of 36 inch storm sewer pipe, um, you know, is going to be costly in terms of, you know, implementation of a project of this magnitude. So uh, we're working towards, uh, you know, hard engineering numbers on that and, you know, detailed estimates in terms of that work. So, you know, if funding opportunities come available or, you know, other opportunities come available, say someone needing uh, borrowed dirt or something like that, you know, we can capitalize on on this opportunity to, you know, we need a hole, you need dirt, so maybe that's a good match um, and try to come up with something that's uh, feasible for the village to implement. But that's what we're looking at right now. Thank you. Any other discussion? Okay. Uh, village manager, I think. Things have been going well since everyone's been back to work full time. Uh, we, uh, I think our biggest problems that we've been facing is complaints with uh, not getting the grass mowed enough, weed whacked in the cemeteries. We've got a, quite a few complaints on the cemeteries that they look terrible. The ball fields look terrible. The pickleball courts look terrible. I only have three full-time employees in the parks department. Uh, unless you guys tell me different, I'm going to bring back the four adults that we've had on part-time. I'm going to bring them back uh, Monday of next week and, and try to be able to catch up. Um, Pat, one question I had, I heard, and I, I, I did not see it, so I cannot attest to it. I heard from most of the people, they had baseball games. South Park this weekend? Is that true? I do not know that. All I know is that uh, uh, if uh, CBSI, they understand and they know that they're to uh, follow the governor's regulations. Uh, if someone showed up and played a baseball game there, I'm not aware of it. It wasn't scheduled. They may have had the diamond scheduled for a practice. But if they played a game and there was more than 10 people out there, then I wasn't aware of it. It, it was my understanding that it was, it was the CBS sign that was a game scheduled against another team. So just so you guys are aware now. How would you I like for us to handle that? Right. I wasn't even around to see it, but it was brought up. Anybody else have any questions for Pat? Okay. Public Friday Recreation Committee discussion. Real quick, real, sorry, real quick on the Pat item. I remember I heard that the pickleball courts are cracking pretty badly. Um, did I hear correctly that the village has no recourse with all weather courts to get those cracks uh, corrected? The, the village did not pay for the full crack repair, and uh, the pickleball people chose to go with uh, fencing instead of paying for the crack repair. So uh, they told us that it would crack, and it has. Okay. 
So that's where we're at on that. I don't think it affects the games. Uh, it's just it shows the crack in it. Okay. Yeah, every court is cracked pretty decent, but you're right. The, the game seem to be all right. But, so that was an option that was available, but we didn't. The pickleball people decided against it. Well, it was one of the options that was presented by the company to turn around and do that. We did not have the funds to be able to do that. Okay. Okay. Uh, parks and planning doing? Public property and recreation committee discussion? Yeah, there, uh, there hasn't been an update since our last meeting, so there have, there's not been a PPRC meeting, so. No news uh, to report there. Okay. Uh, utility oversight committee discussion. We uh, we held uh, we held a uh, a live meeting last night at the village, uh, and we had a discussion, uh, and we talked about. So just so everybody knows, we talked about. Uh, and Paul, correct me if I'm wrong. We we talked about the uh, chloramine uh, switchover. And the frustration uh, with that, because we've been doing that for two and a half years. And uh, so the committee kind of what the committee wants to ask Pat, if we could ask uh, Lee who they uh, talk to about going to this club for me, uh, you know, situation, how many companies he talked to, do they get bid, whatever it may be. All the specifics on what may have been because coming because apparently the switchover is not happening due to COVID. They're not doing insulation. Is that correct, Pat? The last I heard, that was that was the reason they said that uh, that was uh, early this week. Dustin had talked to them, said that the reason that they haven't switched over to chloramines is uh, of uh, scheduling and. Uh, the company that does the work has not been uh, allowing their people to travel. Okay, so the next thing that we talked about um, was the leaf and branch table. And what we discussed was with our question, when we originally, uh, it was going, the contract was going after bid, that the company was going to, um, they were going to pick up all of Chatham's branches. Uh, we have since found out that they, we now have a separate, is it a separate contract now? It is, it's a one year contract. It was initially set up because of all of the branches that we had down there and the, the pile was half burned up, it was soaked, we needed to get it out of there. I needed to hire somebody to come in and take it out. They gave me a price for it and I said, all right, what would you charge to be able to keep this cleaned up the remainder of the year? And then we worked out a price and, and, and now I hired him to do that. So I, I don't know if every other trustee's uh, impression was that that company was supposed to pick up Village of Chatham branches, um, and it's my understanding to get to be able to put in that pile, you have to be a resident of Chatham to get a permit. So those should be all of Village of Chatham branches. Um, Paul, uh, Trustee Churchill pulled the permits. How many permits were during the last year? And so, you know, it was well over 200. And I would think this would be easier for that company to do one stop instead of the 290 some stops they would have, or 12 stops compared to the 200 whatever it was uh, stops. So we were, we, the committee wants to ask uh, Greg if you could look at that contract, the contract we did for the Village of Chatham pickup and see if that can be stretched to um, to include that pile because those are Village of Chatham residents branches and why are we paying double? We're already paying them to pick up Village of Chatham branches and our thought, the committee's thought was it, it'd be easier if they were picking it up in one spot. 
so we just want to know our options with that contract, if you could look at that. Is that right, Greg? Yeah, I uh, will take a look at that, and I'll get um, I'll get my answer off to Pat, and he can circulate it. Thank you, sir. Paul, was there anything uh, I missed with respect to those, the core means and that? Those were the main points. Yeah, the, the core means asking about whether or not uh, there are other uh, companies that could do that. Uh, since that's been delayed so long, uh, the branch picked up and covered. Uh, I think that's a. Uh, we also talked about just our frustration, the, the committee's uh, frustration about uh, just our representation. It, it seems that we ask for stuff and it doesn't happen. Uh, you know, we had Bill Brennan out there um, and they're not following what he's wanting. So we stopped the Bill Brennan. So Bill's no longer going out there, correct, Pat? That's correct. I talked to Jim, I talked to Bill both, and I said, look, no more oversight. They're on their own. It has nothing to do with Bill, uh, for, for, at least for me. It's just we're paying all this money, and if he's giving advice, they're not following why. So we talked about, uh, you know, just for discussion purposes, we talked about would it be better with a better board. We talked about this in the past. Do we want a bigger board and have more representation? And then we got into a discussion, well, the board we have now, it's hard to fill if we had a bigger board. It would, could we even fill it? And then you still could get the same results. So uh, we kind of left that discussion there. Um, there's just a lot of frustration on the committee. And I know, Pat, you have a lot of frustration as well. Um, there's a lot of frustration with just not getting action. Uh, so that's why, uh, Greg, we, we've kind of, we've, so Pat, if you could ask, uh, ask him if, and I, do, is the chair different now? Lee's still the chairman, but the village's representative is Dave Johnson, so. Okay, but Lee, Lee did re retain the, the chair? I think so. No. Okay, good, good. Dave's the so, chairman of it now? Oh, no, Dave's the chairman of it now. So if you can ask Dave then, not Lee, who they contacted uh, for the chloramine, how many people they contacted, what was the process, and why they chose who they chose. All right. Um, just because... Two and a half years is kind of uh, ridiculous, and we could get to some point in the summer where it could it could it could, it could be a bad thing. I mean, we we just need to have them switch to chloramines, and, and it doesn't seem like uh, they ever do. So that was the other uh, thing, Greg. That that was it, Paul. That's what we're missing. Uh, what kind of repercussions do we have contractually with them? I would imagine none. Um, because if you can, if you can, if you monetarily charge them, you're charging yourself. I mean, there's really no uh, repercussions uh, to, in, to ignoring them, us, is there? Um, I look into our remedies and their contractual obligations. This would have been going on a year and a half or, or two years ago, and we are very limited um, when it comes to. Uh, going after them and what they have to provide. So if I recall correctly, they need their contractual requirement is to provide us with uh, potable water. And with the chloramine, that, I, I think we're still receiving that potable water, so I think they would still be in, in technical compliance with, with their obligations. And we really couldn't... The anchor... I, the angle that I was looking at last time had uh, was more of a, uh, a default on our uh, on the payments, and they still have the ability to levy against the citizens anyway. So, uh, but Greg, don't you that if if we get to July and they can't technically provide us the water we need, they're not in compliance. We, as the village of Chatham, have has sought out a secondary source to provide for the needs. He's done the extra work to provide for the village of Chen residents. That SWC is not meeting their contractual obligation to provide. And that's for the water we need. I agree. Yeah, if, if we're not if we're not getting the water that we need, and if we're if we're not at that point by July, then you can start looking at at a breach. If we go down if we go down that road, uh, but they would they would there would need to be an active failure on their part to actually provide us with the water, or uh, they would need to notify you that there's going to be, uh, that, they're, that they're 
going to not be able to meet that obligation. Well, to that point, last for a whole month last summer, they didn't provide us any water. And I don't know if, uh, Pat, if you got much notice before that. They told us that they were going to replace a part. And when they went to do that, then they were out for, like you said, almost a month. Uh, luckily, we have Springfield as an emergency backup supply because I'm sure you as a board don't want to uh, uh, drop that connection to the city of Springfield because uh, we wouldn't want to put water restrictions on our residents or, or uh, turn around and have to shut water off for uh, certain periods of time, not have enough water to be able to put out a fire. So I think uh, we need to keep the emergency contract in place with the city of Springfield. I don't, yeah, I don't disagree. I don't think any of us would say, say that. Okay. And I'll take a look at the contract again. Um, I don't have it here in front of me. Uh, it, it, my guess is there's a decent cure time where they're allowed to fix the problem. And, um, you know, it'd be an extraordinary remedy for this contract to be canceled. Um, there to be able to terminate the contract in a breach of contract case as opposed to perhaps money damages. Um, but so, uh, I'm happy to look at it and, and Greg, let you know. If, if, Greg, I, I'm sorry. If, if they, if we grew to where we needed two and a half million gallons or three million gallons, and they just can't produce it because they're not big enough, would that be a breach? Uh, again, um, I would need to go back. Uh, okay. I. I not sure that it requires that they're required to service the whole village, but um, I don't want to speak out of turn and be, be referencing the, an incorrect contract. If you could just look into it and yeah, let us know so we can tell the a committee because the committee is just really frustrated with the inaction as, as well as everybody is. You know, I'm not sure that the trust, how the trustees are as well. Just to see when, when, is, when is the next when is the next committee meeting? I can have that. It'll be memo. Memo. August uh, oh. Eastern, uh, August 10th. August 5th. 10th. 10. Okay. I'll be. I'll definitely be sure to have a memorandum to you way before then. I, I assumed it would be either later this month or next month. But yeah, I'll review the contract and I'll get you answers to those questions. Thank you so much. Um, and that's what we have. Uh, so does anybody have any questions, discussion about what the uh, committee, the uh, utility committee talked about? All right. Uh, we don't have, uh, so the scheduled meetings, or do we have any public comments on those business? Do either of you two have any public comment? Well, from January to December. You need to come over here so they can hear you, okay? <clears throat> It's been so long since that's been on. I don't know if the batteries work. From January. Oh. Who's speaking? Darlene Judd. From January to December of 2019, the village spent over $125,000 on water investigations. So that is going to go away. The village is not going to have those anymore. Is that correct? That is correct. So uh, when was the last time that the village will be billed for that? I think we've already had the last bill. I think so, but for, as far as water. Yeah. Um, and, and for instance, I, I'm, I'm asking out of turn, I don't happen to be a trustee, but um, of that $125,000, what information was given to anyone for the explanation of why the money was spent? Bill kept Dustin up to date on what was going on out there, and myself. And really, in the end, they, they've kept the plant running, but they have not switched to chloramines. And, and the whole investigation was really for there to be the chloramine. That was basically his purpose for spending $125,000. It was.
was to be our set of eyes out there making sure that they were doing stuff the right way. to City Wildlife and Power's water, is notification ever sent out, or do we just take the risk of the two water plants counteracting each other? We are not required to notify the public. Okay. We check that through the EPA. Okay. And as a citizen, I would ask the board and you to notify us via the system. And the only reason why is the same incident, which I hated bothering you the other night, but I'm zooming over to mom's house speed limit though, I'm going to mom's house and that intersection was closed off. And to me, I didn't know whether it was a water main break or it was a sewer break, you know, what it was out there. So dead my tracks go around the block and mom's going, what's going on? What's going And I don't know. So just a little more notification to the citizens I think would help. It was just a service tap leak. So it didn't affect anyone but that house. So that's why they didn't send out a notification. It affected that's just as important, I would think, for an emergency, you know? So that's just my opinion that, you know, with that traffic that goes along there, it would have been important to notify. So again, I, as a citizen, would like to know when City Water, Light, and Power's water is being pumped to the village of Chatham, because it does make a difference when you are combining the two waters. So thank you for your time. Sure. Pat, for clarity for the board there, can you give a quick definition or description of a process that our utility crew has to take when we are taking uh, water from Springfield and how that's been approved by the EPA? Yeah, we take water from Springfield uh, when we're also taking water from the uh, South Sangamon. We take the water from Springfield on Route 4, and they pressurize the mains in such a way that it doesn't push back up into the towers as long as we're getting sufficient pressure from the South Sangamon and the pumps. When we do that, our crews are required to go around and take additional chlorine samples. So they go around town so many times a day and take chlorine levels to see where the chlorine has changed. And they can tell from that sample on whether CWLP water has moved into that area or whether it's still the water from the South Sangamon. We record all that stuff and we turn that stuff over to the EPA. So it's at the whole point it's monitored and there's no notification requirement the EPA puts on that? We've asked them in the past if we need to notify our residents and they said no. There's no danger. Okay. Thank you. Any other discussion from the trustees on that? Okay. Schedule a meeting of committee of the whole 615 Municipal Hall, July 14th, 2020. Uh, do we have any reason for a closed session? Nope. All right, no. Can I get a, uh, Mr. Mann, can I get a motion to uh, adjourn? I will make a motion that we adjourn. Uh, Mr. Mann uh, made motion to adjourn. Uh, Trustee Charles, can I get a second? I'll second that motion. And can we get a roll just to make it official? Trustee Mann? Yes. Trustee Charles? Yes. Trustee Miles? Left the building. Trustee Mercy? Yes. Trustee Churchill? Yes. And Chairman Berger? Yes. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Thank you.